Hello friends, in this lecture, I shall be talking to you about a very commonly used radiological test which is intravenous urography for diagnosis making of primary ureteric junction obstruction. And this lecture is part 1 and this will continue as part 2 also. A very common clinical scenario is this. A 32 year old rural male underwent ultrasonography of abdomen for vague pain in some part. And the ultrasound report comes like this. That there is a hydronephrosis in let's say left kidney. When you want to find out whether this hydronephrotic kidney is obstructed or not, you want a diuretic DTPA renal scan which may either not be available in that area or it may be too expensive for the patient or it may be too difficult for the patient to get the proper time and date. So in absence of a DTPA scan, can you find something meaningful from intravenous urography and Will you be able to make a proper diagnosis of pelvic ureteric junction obstruction? In intravenous urography, the first film is a control film, which is a plain skygram. And traditionally, we expect you to look at the renal shadow and also look for a, a radiopaque shadow in the film. For the renal shadow, you will only see the lower convex margin of the kidney like that here. The top hole of the kidney is hidden by the liver on the right side and by the spleen on the left side so it's not properly visible. The radiopaque shadows are very often seen in patients of PUG obstruction and they are co-associated secondary stones and you will see them multiple uh, stones at different locations. So when you go to the contrast films of intravenous urography, traditionally you have been used to seeing renal enlargement, parenchymal thinning, calicial dilatation, degree of pelvic dilatation and shape and the ureter is not visualized. So that is what you often comment in the film. But let us see, can we see some more radiographic signs in these films and have some meaningful information. You can see some new parenchymal signs, you can see calicial signs, you can see some signs in pelvis and of course some signs in ureter. In this part 1 lecture, I will be talking only of parenchymal signs, rest we will talk in part 2. The parenchymal signs are also called nephrographic signs because they are seen in the nephrographic phase of intravenous urography. But in some patients, they often persist in the later films also. First thing should be trying to see the location of kidney in the body. Is it located at normal location or is the kidney located at abnormal location, the ectopic location? So for example, this is a plain film and when more contrast films were done, the both kidneys are located in the pelvis and the left kidney is showing hydronephrosis. So this is a not a normally located kidney. The next thing you should see is, is the renomegaly and for making an impression, you have to compare both kidneys first and then you have to compare the size of a kidney with the height of three lumbar vertebrae. If you see this kind of film, right kidney and left kidney and that is the long axis of kidney slightly obliquely placed. You measure the height of three vertebral bodies. 
the length of the kidney should be almost equal to three vertebral bodies. Say in this case, this is the height of the three vertebral bodies and this is the length of the right kidney. But if you see the shadow of the left kidney, you will notice that this is bigger. So that is how you make impression about Renovigali. What is the parenchymal thickness of the kidney? The parenchymal thickness is measured as distance between interpapillary line and the line on the kidney surface. The normal parenchymal thickness in adults ranges from 2.5 cm in mid portion and 3.5 cm at poles. The cortical outline is here drawn by dotted lines running all along the kidney outline. But if you see this line, second line D, these dots have been made on the by joining the minor calices and they represent the innermost border of renal cortex. It's called interpapillary line. And the distance between two lines is the pancamma thickness. Next, you should try to observe that do you see any semilunar opacity in the parenchyma abutting the convex margin of dilated calyx. The, or we'll often see these thin semilunar opacities which are denser than the nephrogram. And they result from the accumulation of contrast material in juxta calicial medulla. Say here, the right kidney shows you normal pellicle system, but in the left kidney, you will see these denser semilunar lines here and here. And these are the lines in the innermost part of the medulla. The renal margin is lying here. That these semilunar lines are called crescents. Crescent. This film shows you crescents more clearly by orange arrows. What are these crescents? When parenchymal thickness is uh, reduced but not too much reduced, the renal function is moderately preserved, you will often see these crescents in urography. These crescents are thin semilunar collections of contrast and they appear denser than the rest of the parenchyma, I have already said that. These crescents, they are running parallel to the convex margin of the enlarged calyx and they are located in the inner edge of the nephrogram. Why the crescent form? This is the magnified view of the minor calyx and you see these longitudinal collecting ducts which open on the papilla. Right? So that's how they are arranged. When the calyx starts dilating, the papilla starts becoming flattened out like that. They become more flattened out. But if you see the peripherally located collecting ducts like the one here and as the calyx dilates more those ducts which are lying little peripherally they tend to get pulled elongated and now they lie all along the convexity of the calyx like the way shown here and when the nephrons excrete contrast the contrast comes in the collecting duct because of the higher intracalicial pressure, these ducts do not drain into the calyx smoothly. The contrast stays back in the collecting ducts and the water is reabsorbed from the collecting duct. So the contrast looks more dense. So it is here in the collecting ducts that the contrast is getting accumulated for a while. And this forms the crescent. So crescents are actually opacified collecting ducts which are arranged along the convex border of the calyx. The importance of crescent is that they show you there is still some concentrating ability in the collecting duct, which means there is a preserved function. And if you treat the kidney, if you treat the obstruction, kidney will have salvageable function. So crescent has good prognostic value. You may ask me a question, how do you differentiate the crescent from the contrast which is outlining 
a dependent part of the dilated calyx. The simple answer will be, if you change the position of the patient, the contrast which is in the collecting duct and which is showing you as crescent will remain static, it will not change. But if you have contrast in the calyx, in the calyxial lumen, as you change the position from prone to supine or lateral, the contrast will move in the dilated calyx. So, calyxial contrast will change the position, but crescent will not change the position. The next pen camel sign is what's called soap bubble appearance. The soap bubble nephrogram refers to overlapping curved white densities several millimeter thick that appear after IV or intraarterial injection. Look at this picture of use of traction and you will see three soap bubble like pictures. What is the soap bubble sign? There is a some residual nephronal mass between the two dilated calyx and this is the column of burden in between and each bubble represents a dilated calyx. The picture on your left is showing you dilated calyx and in between the calyx you can see the residual parenchyma, the column of burden. So this residual column of burden will enhance with contrast and if you cut a section at this level you will see it like soap bubble. But gradually, gradually kidney will become more hydronephrotic and it will become a unilocular sac as shown in the next picture. And as you see it like a unilocular sac, the soap bubble nephrogram will be replaced by what is called rim nephrogram or also known as shell nephrogram because now you have only shell shaped parenchyma. So please appreciate the difference between soap bubble nephrogram and shell nephrogram. So thank you very much for your patient listening. We will continue the description of intravenous urology, science and PUG obstruction in part 2. If you have any questions, you can write to my email, drdalila24 at gmail.com.